This is incident KL160103048, the death investigation of Solomon Fakiri. This is a video of Unit 8 segregation at the Central East Correctional Center in Lindsay. My family's been waiting for answers for the last year and a half. Why did my brother get killed under government care? Why did he have 50 bruises on his body? Why was both his hand and his legs tied? A few months ago, Yusuf Fakiri reached out to me about his 30-year-old brother who had died inside this Ontario jail under suspicious circumstances. I need the Fifth Estate to help us. I want to know what happened to my brother. Please help us. I decided to meet Yusuf in person. How are you feeling? We're still in pain, We're still yeah. suffering. We're still looking to find closure. Why was he killed? He left our family as a healthy man and he gave him to us in a body bag. So you want to know what happened in that cell? Yeah, he did not just roll over and die. Suleiman was a straight-A student, captain of his high school rugby team, who would toy with the idea of becoming a professional athlete. He then began studying engineering at the University of Waterloo. That's when he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Then, his family watched as Suleiman's world quickly began to unravel. Hi, and this is Sam. Hi, nice hi, hi Sam. Nice to meet you guys. Yusuf invites me to their home to meet his brothers. So Sam is the third of five. Okay. And uh, Ali is the youngest. What do you remember the most about him? Uh, his smile. I say he loved me the most out of all the brothers. <laughs> uh, That's funny. We go inside for a cup of Persian tea. Genuinely, just a good heart. Always try to do the best when he could. Mm. But unfortunately, it's um, mental illness has a way of taking a toll on people. And yeah. it's, um, How did his schizophrenia affect him day to day? Lack of sleep, I'd say, was the biggest uh, issue for Solomon. What is it, how did that play out? Um, well, there's times a day, like there's times where he wouldn't have slept for like maybe three, four days. He'd be uncomfortable. It would be difficult for him because he tried to go to sleep. He just wouldn't be able to. Well, it must be debilitating. Yeah, it was debilitating. It, you know, he wanted to have a life as close as to what he could, uh, you know, in terms of normalcy. Yeah. Whenever he took this medication, the side effects are unreal with these pills. They, they'll, they'll make him hungry. They'll make him super sleepy. They'll make restless. him you know, restless. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? No doubt, some days were worse than others. like this one. This video was filmed at the local gym where he usually worked out. But things weren't always this bleak. When Suleiman moved from Afghanistan to Canada as a child, life seemed promising. Would you remember when you guys came to Canada? Yes, I do. How old were you and all those in? Suleiman was, was eight and I was 10. What was that like for you guys? It was difficult yeah. at first because, uh, you know, there was a language barrier. He picked up English faster than me. Over the years, Suleiman had several run-ins with the law. Usually, he was taken to a hospital, treated and discharged. However, in December 2016, when he allegedly attacked his neighbor, this time, instead of a hospital, he was taken to a jail cell. What exactly happened to Suleiman in those 11 days that followed? Our investigation begins here. We obtained nearly 2,000 pages of documents, police reports, forensic records, including hundreds of crime scene photos. The police investigation notes say Suleiman was being aggressive, assaulting guards, and after being restrained, he died. The autopsy report concluded the cause of death was unascertained. 
In other words, not known. That's what the family was told. With no cause of death, the investigation was closed. We wonder if clues might be buried in the reams of medical documents and records. We have here the various police reports. Yes. So we enlisted the help of a leading forensic pathologist, Dr. John Butt. And these would be the autopsy photos. Yeah, okay, these are the scene. That's right, yeah. These are the scene photographs. Right. He agrees to review them for us and see whether based on the evidence, he can determine an actual cause of death. Meanwhile, we set out to talk to potential witnesses. We reach out to the guards. Many of them on duty that day were suspended. None of them respond to our request to talk. How about inmates? What did they see? In the police notes we obtained was this name, Anthony Olette. Hi, Anthony. Hi. I'm Habiba. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you for... He was in the cell next to Solomon. I'm hoping you can tell me a little bit about what was he like? Yeah, the first time I met him um, was the day after he arrived because he kept the whole range up all night because he was banging his, you know, he was panicking or he was like, looked very agitated. So I couldn't really understand what he was saying. What was he doing? Um, walking around, like I looked right in the cell when I went there and he was just, he was walking around his cell naked. I just said, are, are you okay? Do you need help? And then he kept saying, yeah, help, help, help. Mm. Like, repeating it, you know? He, he didn't eat. Um, he wouldn't come near his door when the guards tried to feed him. He was um, chanting, oh, Canada, for some reason, over and over and over. That's what we all remember. This was an individual that not only suffered from mental illness, I believe shouldn't have been in jail in the first place. All the correctional officers that were on the floor at that time were arguing with the doctor to get him to a hospital. And he said, I heard it right directly out of his mouth, he doesn't meet the criteria to be sanctioned to a hospital. Instead of a hospital, Solomon was moved to another segregation unit where things would quickly escalate. What is your emergency? I'm a nurse at Central East Correctional Center. We have an inmate with vital signs absent. Okay, and do you know what happened? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. We, I just arrived on scene. CPR, they were doing compressions um, okay. as I was leaving. Well, in here, let's get you to sit over there in the purple seat. Sure. This is the police interview with the paramedic who was the first to arrive on the scene. You responded as a medic to that? I did. What can you tell me? What did you see? Oh, just to start off, it was an unusual circumstance. They simply said that it's a gentleman that uh, was, was schizophrenic, I believe he said, and really not all was there, and he was acting out. They had to use physical force to get him from point A to point B, and they pepper sprayed him twice. That was the information I'm gathering on the way yep. to the scene. It was kind of chaotic, to be honest with you. A little chaotic. He had like, like, like ligature marks on, on his wrists and ankles, like from the, presumably the shackles or whatever. But he looked pretty dead. Right. Sorry for lack of a better yep. way of saying it. He told the investigators when he tried to find out how Suleiman had died, the story kept changing. Something that left him feeling uneasy. The superintendent there started getting antsy and concerned and kind of like almost having attitude with me a little bit because I was asking all these questions. I stopped her dead in her tracks and I don't really care who you are at this point in time. I'm the vascular paramedic who just got a pronouncement for a 30 year old man and I needed a straight story and I need to know what's going on. When we come back, we meet a man whose testimony just might crack open the case. The last thing I want is my face on the news. There's certain rules you follow in jail and snitching is one of them, right? My family's been waiting for answers for the last year and a half. Answers as to what happened to our loved one. How my brother Solomon Fikiri, a man who suffered from severe mental illness, schizophrenia, was killed under government care. What continues to nag Yusuf 
is that his brother's death was deemed unascertained. Even when there were dozens of bruises all over his body and a detailed autopsy, still no medical cause of death. How's that possible? So this is where it says unascertained. We had shared the records and the autopsy reports with forensic pathologist Dr. John Butt to get a second opinion. Now he's ready to give us his findings. So looking at this evidence, can you determine a cause of death? In my opinion, yeah. I would bring this death more to the area of a restraint-related death associated with agitation of the individual in a situation that is commonly called excited delirium. Is excited delirium a scientific cause of death? Can it be? Yes. Looking at? You I would can, put that on a death certificate? Yeah, I would in this case. Dr. Butt points to key injuries on Suleiman's body, including deep bruising that indicate where there was pressure on his neck. What could have that been? Could have been hands on the neck, could have been an arm around the neck, um, could have been a foot on the neck. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What I hear you saying is that he died because he couldn't breathe anymore. Yes. But were there any eyewitnesses? According to the police notes, John Tebow was in the cell opposite to Suleiman when he died. The police had suspected he may have seen what happened, but he refused to talk to them. He's out of jail now and agrees to meet with me. All right. Can you tell me what you saw? I seen one of the guards say something, whisper into his ear. I don't know what he said. I couldn't hear it, but I know that it agitated him. And he started resisting to go in the cell. And then when he did that, one of the guards um, sprayed pepper spray in his face. And you could see all that? Yeah. So they got him in the cell. Okay. And they started beating him. Right away, the female guard hops up onto the bunk, the bed, because it's yeah. higher up. Because the guards, the four guards that were directly on him, they're yeah. all, all, each one of those guards is at least over 250, 260 pounds. This corner of the bed right here, mm -hmm. That's where they put his head when they were kicking his head off the corner of the bed, in that corner right there in the bunk. It's horrible. Solomon was able to get up, stand straight up with all that weight on his back, close to a thousand pounds at least, on his back, trying to hold him down, punching him, kicking him, beating him, just whatever shots they could get in. And every time he got up, the only place he had to run was the back of the cell, and I seen him run into the wall two or three times. This went on over 10 minutes before they called the code blue finally. All this stuff was According to him, amid the chaos, one of the guards noticed that Tebow had witnessed the entire event before his window shade was closed. It was clear he had seen too much. There was a smaller guard. Now, he, when he heard the other inmates freaking out, what I noticed is I was sitting there was watching. He had a knee on Solomon's neck. Solomon's not moving, like I said. He has a knee on his neck and he, He's yelling, stop resisting, stop resisting. He wasn't moving at all. If someone asked you what happened to Solomon in there, how would you describe how he died? They beat him to death. Like, I don't, I don't know how else to describe it at all. There's no, there's no other answer. Mm -hmm. They viciously beat him to death. I think that's what killed him. He stopped breathing because of that. If I had to guess, I'm not a doctor or whatever, but I know what I've seen. What did they, the investigators ask you when they showed up? They said they were there to investigate a incident that happened earlier in the day and that they reviewed the cameras and they believed that uh, I witnessed what happened. What did you say? I told them that I didn't witness anything, that I was sleeping. Why did you say that? Because of the circumstances, the situation I was in. You were afraid? Yeah. To be honest with you, yes. I haven't talked about this with anybody besides you guys. The last thing I want is my face on the news, on TV. A criminal who's been breaking the law for this long, the last thing they want is, is their picture all over the place or the 
there's certain rules you follow in jail and snitching isn't one of them, right? This is the chap from across the hall in the cell. Exactly. Yes. We share the account of the eyewitness, John Tebow, with Dr. Butt to see if it matches up with the medical evidence. They said they couldn't determine a cause of death. That was inconclusive how he died. Because there were so many different things that could have killed him. I don't think they can <laughs> determine which one it was for sure. There was interesting four guards. There was a thousand pounds of weight on top of him. There's a guard with a knee on his neck. There's his head being smashed off metal. Numerous punches to the head. Pretty sure it was 12, 13 minutes of nonstop violence, nonstop beating. Like, in my eyes, it was unjustified. There was no reason why. Hmm. The statement that I heard provided by the by the witness, I thought was a credible statement. Um, it was well organized and I have no reason to criticize it. Dr. Butt says if the coroner's office had heard the statement from John Tebow, it might have led to a cause of death. I think it's a sort of a case that might be a good one for review. So let me get this right. You think that this would justify reopening this investigation? Yeah, I do. I think it would justify reopening the investigation. I do that. I do feel that. Solomon's autopsy was overseen by the Ontario Coroner's Office. We shared with the chief coroner Dr. Butt's conclusion, along with Thibault's account. Turns out there is a new development. We became aware of additional information. That was brought to my attention, and I felt that that, invest, that information did require further investigation within a criminal justice perspective. While we were looking into the case, he has quietly reopened the criminal investigation. And this time, it's the provincial police, not the local force, handling the case. To this day, no one has been charged in Suleiman's death. But with the investigation now reopened, all that could change. Do you ever think about him? Every day. It's funny, I don't even know him. Never even met him. Former inmate John Tebow says, even two years later, he is still haunted by the beating he witnessed that day. You wish you hadn't seen it? I've been through hell since I've seen it. Of course, I wish I didn't see it. Wish it didn't happen. At the end of our interview, Tebow says he's now ready to talk to the investigators. This is a stepping stone, right? To me, it's a stepping stone. It's the first step I've taken into uh, getting justice for Solomon and the family. Yusuf had reached out to us for answers. Yusuf, how are you? Good, how are you? How are you? Six months after our initial meeting, we meet again, this time to tell him what we uncovered. So we sent all the records about your brother's investigation to an independent forensic pathologist. And he said that your brother died as a result of excited delirium related to restraint. And uh, what I take it to mean is he couldn't breathe. He couldn't breathe? Yeah. So he suffocated. Does it help to know it all, the, what the cause of death was? Yes, it's important. It's critical. Do you want to keep going? Yes. There was a witness, um, and this man was in the cell right across from your brother. He saw the guards attacking your brother. and your brother, according to what he said to us, was not fighting back. So these were the last few moments of his life. And the final thing is that, um, because new information has come to the chief coroner's office, he's asked to reopen the criminal investigation into your brother's death. 
It's a good start, Habiba. It's an important start. It gives me hope that, that my brother's memory can help others, that, uh, that there's so many others that are suffering in silence. If some good that comes out of my late brother's life, if we can save someone else, then that's what we want as his memory. Suleiman's story needs to be heard. So another father, another mother, another brother doesn't bury their loved one. It has to be heard. Yusuf finally has some answers as to what happened to his brother. But now begins the new chapter, getting justice for Suleiman.